if anyone can lay claim to having a golden toe, it's Jim Bakken, four-time NFL All-Pro kicker for the St. Louis Cardinals. For 17 years, the points after touchdowns and field goals were almost automatic for the Cardinals, thanks to Bakken. Those one and three pointers kicked by Bakken's golden toe added up to the most points ever scored by a big red player. In fact, when Jim Bakken retired in 1979, he ranked second in total points scored in the entire history of the National Football League. Of all his games, one in particular stands out. I have a lot of great memories of my years in the NFL, but if I had to choose one that stands out the most, I guess it would have to be the game where I kicked seven field goals. That's still an NFL record. I suppose I have more than ordinary reasons to refer to this good old right foot as the foot with the golden toes. It did a pretty good job of earning my living for many years. But you know, the same thing could be said about most of you watching. I'll bet you'd find it difficult to continue earning your living without sound toes and feet to carry you through your workday. The fact is, when you think about it, your toes are just as golden as mine. This is the kind of shoe I wore on the job during my NFL years. It's designed specifically for kicking with a squared and upturned toe to put more foot into the ball, as they say, like this. Soccer-style kickers use the side of their foot, so they don't need a squared toe. Most of them use a regular soccer shoe, just like this. The typical football shoe is built for support and to provide good footing on whatever surface is being used, as well as for particular weather conditions. What all that really means is that a football shoe is designed to help the player to do his job. In other words, it's designed to help him keep on the job and keep his job security. There are shoes designed to do the same thing for you, too. Let me demonstrate what I mean. Here's a pretty common working scene. Two men involved in a relatively simple but potentially dangerous situation. Suddenly, the worst happens. That heavy crate landed on the toes of these two men. The type of accident that usually has great potential for serious injury. The result emphasizes what I mean by shoes providing job security. Henry was one of the men injured in the accident. That was three weeks ago, Henry. Do you expect to return to work soon? I don't really know, Jim. At this point, they can't tell whether I'll ever be able to handle that kind of work again. I don't know how I'll make a living if I can't. The worst part is not knowing if you'll be able to walk right again. You nearly lost several toes. It sure changes a lot of your life. I mean, the pain was bad enough, but... Now I can't work. I can't even drive the car. And then there are a lot of little things that I really miss, like, well, I can't go bowling with the guys. Ah, it makes me feel so stupid, because I didn't even do the most basic thing to try to help protect myself. Henry's right. One simple precaution could have helped reduce the injury, maybe prevented it. Here's the proof. Chuck was the other man involved in the accident. His toes received about the same weight and force as Henry's, but he hasn't lost a single day's work. Chuck, let's show everybody what made the difference. As you can probably see, the shoe is scuffed and slightly dented. The shoe looks very much like the one Henry was wearing, but it's a high-test safety shoe designed to keep Chuck on the job, to help Chuck keep his job with some very special protection for his toes. Let's take a close look at what I mean. This is the kind of shoe that Henry wore. It's a typical work shoe. Watch what happens when we test this shoe against a high-test safety shoe. We'll put these wax forms inside both shoes so we can really compare the test results and give you a better idea of what happened to the toes of the two men. First, the drop test. A 50-pound weight from a height of one and a half feet. Let's see how Henry's typical work shoe takes the test. Ouch! That hurts just watching it. Wow, look at this. The shoe gave practically no protection. So as you might expect, the wax form is really crushed.
But watch what happens when we put the high test safety shoe that Chuck was wearing to the same test. Note how well the high test shoe resisted the force and how well it protected the wax form. That's a dramatic difference. You can see why it meant job security for Chuck. High test safety shoes with metatarsal guards offer even greater protection as the guards cover the instep. Here's the same test. Look at that, not even a scratch. The metatarsal guard sure did its job here. Now we'll use the same test on Henry's ordinary work shoe, dropping the weight on the instep. Uh-oh, there could be permanent damage if a real foot were in there. Look at this. The difference in protection that a high-test safety shoe gives you will make a believer out of anyone. But falling objects aren't the only danger to toes. There are rolling dangers that can exert great pressure. This compression test shows the effect that an accident involving this kind of heavy equipment would have on a work shoe. There's almost no resistance. But our safety shoe puts up plenty of resistance. This picture says it best. What's the difference in the shoes? It's this exclusive high-test anchor flange steel toe which locks snugly over the insole of our safety shoes. Thanks to this flange, you can't even see it's there, except when you really need it, and thousands of workers need it every day. But some don't realize it until it's too late. The National Safety Council recently released some very meaningful figures about foot injuries, which back that up. Of 1,251 workers surveyed with foot injuries, 77% or over 900 of them were not wearing safety shoes. In other words, Safety shoes work. They can help reduce or minimize serious injury to your toes. A man who can attest to this is Gene Mohan of International Shoe Company, makers of the high test safety shoe. That's right, Jim. We have over 15,000 case histories that tell us how toe accidents actually happen. And they also tell us how safety shoes help reduce serious injury, and in many cases actually prevent serious injury. You know, High Test is a sponsor and the originator of the Golden Shoe Club. It's an award program that recognizes people that had an accident or a near accident, but actually prevented serious injury because they were wearing safety shoes. We award about 400 of these personalized Golden Shoe plaques each year. That's about 400 accidents that we know about. Just think of how many happen that we don't know about. Here are some case histories that just recently came in the mail. Remember. These are fact, not fiction. Bob Self works in a large shipping department. Well, we were loading this truck, as you can see to my left, it's the rear of us here. And uh, that uh, brace that we are using back there for support to the box weighs approximately 35 to 45 pounds. The vibration of the truck shook the brace and it slid off of the wall, striking the end of my toe. And if I didn't have the shoes on, I'm afraid I would have been seriously injured. Bob, are you all right? I'm not even hurt. If I had not been wearing safety shoes, it would give me serious injury. Roseanne Beely, who works in a warehouse, had a forklift truck carrying two tons of glass roll over her foot. You're on my foot! But I thought, when he rolls back, I thought, God, my foot's going to be smashed, you know, because of all of this glass. But uh, then I went and I took it off right away because I thought it's going to swell up. And then uh, I took it off, and there wasn't hardly anything, just a little bruise there, and the shoe looked just fine. If I hadn't have been wearing a safety shoe, I think I wouldn't have a foot, because, it, well, the glass weighs two tons. Tom Gregory works for an auto parts manufacturer. A heavy fixture weighing about 35 pounds fell directly onto Tom's toes. The result, only a small bruise. Victor Ladendecker dropped a heavy tray of auto carburetor parts onto his foot, the result, a cut in the shoe, no damage at all to his foot. We asked Victor if he would go on wearing safety shoes. You can bet that I will always wear safety shoes from now on, yes. 
You know, the shoes that football players wear in their work are very expensive and certainly nothing you'd want to wear on the street or around the house. But that's not true of safety shoes. They can look like any other good work shoe. But they can also look like any other casual shoe or dress shoe. Nice looking styles, aren't they? And High Test makes some very fashionable women's shoes and a number of good looking western boots. Nobody knows their safety shoes but you. And wouldn't it be nice to be wearing one of these when a 280 pound lineman steps on your toes? Safety shoes cost about the same as other good quality regular shoes, but they're deductible on your income tax. And here's something regular shoes don't normally have. Every pair of high test safety shoes is sanitized treated to fight bacteria and odor. Well, that's a brief look at how you can keep your golden toes golden. One thing's for sure, we don't want you to try for one of these nice looking plaques. We just want you to be prepared for one in case the situation makes it necessary. Be prepared. Don't confuse typical work shoes with safety shoes. Safety shoes are different. They do provide protection every day on and off the job. They can save your toes so you don't have to try to get along without them. They're golden, all 10 of them. Take it from me. I wear them all the time. Hello, welcome. I'm Skip Alzheimer. Welcome to our AV Geeks lunchtime streaming show. Um, that was Golden Toe, and it was brought to us by a sponsored film company. Um, and in the can, I don't really know where I got that film from. I'm trying to do a little bit of research. Um, but there's in the can, there's just this thing that says free films for schools and organizations, 16 millimeter sound motion pictures. And there are a variety of different things. So there's um, A Day with Annabelle, sponsored by Anheuser-Busch, presents the basics of seamanship and safe boat handling on ocean-going yachts and boats with cooperation with the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, there is, uh, let's see, the thermal wilderness de depicts heat impairments and heat craft used to prevent becoming, um, prevent their becoming heat emergencies while enjoying the outdoors. Your brain must supply what your involuntary cool system lacks, the ability to think ahead, make plans, and fight an, intel an intelligent, resourceful battle. That could have been word it a lot easier. Um, oh, but this is only available in North Dakota, South Dakota, Illinois, Kansas, Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, and um, Wisconsin. Ripple. Basic boat outfitting, preparation, towing, inspection of seaworthiness, safety courtesy, seamanship for inland waterway. Wow. Okay. So there's a variety of different films here. And so this was a company that basically would um, get sponsorship and get paid by these different sponsors uh, to rent out films, which were basically ads. So that you saw this was an ad for High Top. Um, I was going to show you a public service announcement that I made. Uh, oh, sorry, High Test. Uh, public service announcement that I made for... Um, why I'm, it's important to wear shoes in the archive, and I, I just need to find it. Um, because I did not wear safety shoes in the archive. In fact, I was barefoot, and a, a bad thing happened. Anyways, so I collect old 16 millimeter films and show them to folks like you, if you don't know by now. And now I'm a proud owner of a pallet jack to accommodate 13 pallets of films that are showing up tomorrow. 
What are in those films? It's almost all coronet. So we're going to be watching a lot of coronet over the next couple of years. Um, but here's a film that's not coronet. This was made by a filmmaker who made short kind of art films. Um, not in the, well about surfing and things like that. But also he did industrial films for outboat motor companies. And uh, this is an interesting film and it has a celebrity in it. Can you spot that celebrity? Enjoy. Maybe you woke up, Dad. Are you telling the story about William? Daddy wants me to tell you the story. Don't you want to hear the story, Maggie? Now you can't get out of your bed. You have to watch. I mean, you have to listen. Don't cry, Maggie. Once upon a time, there was a little girl and a big boy. And the boy was Matt. And the little girl was Lisa. Now, Maggie, I'm telling you the story. Once upon a time, Lisa said, There's nothing good to watch on TV. Why don't we go out in the woods and play? So then they went behind a bush, and there was a snake. And then Matt said, Snake, why do you always go like this? Whew. And the snake said, Well, I don't got any rattle. And so the other rattlesnakes just think, I'm just a plain snake, and I want to be, I want to be a rattlesnake, so I can have a rattle on my tail. So then Matt got some tinker toys, and he put a tinker toy on the snake's tail, and then he could be a rattlesnake. And then the snake said, whenever I think of you, I'll just go like this. And then they came out, and they were walking a little bit more, and they came to a place, and they heard something that was going, and then they looked behind a bush. And they saw that it was an elephant. And they said, Elephant, why do you always go? And the elephant said, Why, I got a peanut stuck in my nose. And then Lisa said, You're not supposed to blow in your nose. You're supposed to blow out your nose. So then the elephant said, Could I come along with you? And whenever I think of you, I'll just go. So then they sounded like this. So then they came to another place, and they came to a Martian noise, and they saw a penguin. And then they said, why do you make a Martian noise? Well, because I'm really a Martian. And if you believe, I believe you, I believe you. And the penguin said, whenever I think of you, I'll just go, and then he went like this. So then they went behind something, and they saw a monkey that went, zoom. So then Lisa said, why do you always go, zoom? And the monkey said, well, I'm a speeder monkey. And then Lisa said, no, you're not. You're a spider monkey. You're not supposed to be a speeder monkey. You're supposed to be a spider monkey. So then, whenever I think of you, I'll just go, zoom. So then they sounded like this. Zoom. And then they went into the forest and they saw a gooey duck. Why do you go? And the gooey duck said, Because I'm so gooey. And then Lisa said, If you're so gooey, then I think I'll put a towel around your neck. So then the gooey duck said, whenever I think of you, I'll just go. So then they sounded like this. <laughs> then they went a little bit farther. And then they heard a noise that went like this. Shh, be quiet. I'm not going to tell you the story. So then, don't cry, Maggie. 
So then they heard something that went, ouch, and then they went behind his stick. And they said, why do you say, ouch? And the giraffe said, I've got a sore back. And Lisa said, I'll give you some fast, fast relief aspirin so it won't hurt you every time you say ouch. And they sounded like this. Oh, my back. Zoop. And there was something that went, yawn. And the frog said, I'm so sleepy. And he said, I'll get you some coffee. And you won't always have to be sleepy. And the frog said, you should be sleepy too when you go to bed at night. And then they sounded like this. Yawn. Oh my God. <laughs> We're gonna go to bed now. All right, did you catch it? Did you figure out who it was? The uh, celebrity? Um, so I first watched this film, I had it for years. And the thing is the title is so generic, the story that, you know, is, is it about, is it an English film about, you know, uh, the story, what a story is, or, you know, it, it just very generic title. Um, watching it, the kid is very, uh, creative and I uh, at the end Homer Greening is the filmmaker and it's his son Matt who's telling the story and it features his daughters Lisa and Maggie uh, that might sound familiar because of the Simpsons um, I use this film as an example when I talk to students who are interested in film archiving um, or motion image moving image archiving as a, a reason to always watch films. Because uh, I had a description of what this film was based on a catalog, but it didn't have who made it. It just basically said, you know, young boy tells creative story to sisters, bedtime story to sisters. Um, and it's only years, decades after it made that the importance of who that young boy was suddenly came out um, as Matt Graney. So uh, I posted this on YouTube and it went viral many times, and I actually got a call from Matt Groening's lawyer who was saying, like, hey, I saw that you put this film online. Where did you get it from? And I was like, well, I got it from a school auction. And he's like, oh, um, my client thought that this was a personal film that his father had made for the family, and he was wondering how you got access to it. And I said, well, you know, you can look it up. You can see that it was actually in distribution by this film company. And uh, I said, you know, I have a great deal of respect for Matt Groening for many of his projects. And, um, you know, I'd be sad to take it down, but I understand it if he feels like it's it's too personal. And the lawyer's like, nah, don't worry about it. Um, so that was, phew. I was kind of hoping that Matt Groening would reach out to me so I could reach out to him, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, um... There's the story. There are other Homer Graining films, uh, one called Psychedelic Wet, uh, which is about surfing, and then there's a couple of others, which I can't remember the title, but if you look it up, um, you'll see that there's references to it. Um, yeah. Uh, so this next film we got lined up is um, What You Eat, 
you are. Enjoy. You are, or are you what you eat? Let's find out. People like to feel good and look good. They like to sleep well and stay healthy. Don't you? Do these things depend on what you eat? What does food mean to you and your family? Children like food because it tastes good or looks good. They eat food because it's time to or when they get hungry. But smart parents know that their children must eat to grow, to build strong bodies, and to stay wide awake and healthy. Just as growing plants need food, water, and care, your body needs a mixture of the right foods every day to grow strong and healthy, and even to make you feel happy and full of energy. In other words, you need good nutrition. Nutrition comes from the food you eat and from the way your body uses it. Part of the food you eat provides energy for you to move. Other parts provide your body with all the material it needs to grow and repair itself. These parts are called nutrients, and your body needs many different kinds of nutrients. One kind will give you the energy to play and work, while another will make your bones grow strong. Still another helps you fight off disease. No one food has all the nutrients you need, so it's important that you eat different kinds of food. This is what is known as a balanced diet. A balanced diet consists of meat and other protein foods, fruits and vegetables, milk and dairy products, and the enriched grain products, such as bread, rice, grits, and cereals. For most members of a family, good nutrition comes from simply eating the food prepared for them. But for the housewife or whoever is in charge of meal planning, it is very important to know how to prepare a balanced diet. To stretch food dollars and get the best nutrition possible within a limited budget, you must plan your meals carefully. When you shop, always use a list. Before you go to the store, decide what you will need for each meal until the next time you shop. Buy only what you can safely store while it is fresh. Nutrition workers teach that flour, meal, sugar, cereals, crackers, and rice should be kept tightly closed in metal or plastic containers or screw-top jars. Save plastic bread wrappers and snap lid containers to use for safe storage or opened packages. Be careful to cover any leftover food that is saved. Even things kept in the refrigerator should be covered so that the flavor will not be lost or picked up by another food. Sometimes you can save money by buying a larger size in some products, but learn what you can store and for how long because some things will spoil before they can be used. Check newspaper ads for special food sales and plan your meals around these. Look for the thrifty buys because different food stores vary in their prices. When you shop, always check the amount printed on the package. Often the store where you shop carries its own brand of a particular food at a lower cost. Don't be fooled by fancy packages. A plain package may cost less for the same amount of food. Remember, it's the amount and quality of food which is important, not the size or beauty of the package. Plan your meals before you shop. It is easy to give your family a balanced diet and probably with the food budget you now use. Just make sure that each day your family gets food from the four basic food groups. Because each group of food contains a particular nutrient which is needed by the body. By selecting food from each food group, you can be assured that your family is getting a balanced diet. These four groups are the milk group, as something from this group for everybody. And we should eat four servings of fruits and vegetables, as well as two servings of meat or other protein food every day. We all need to eat four servings of enriched grain products from the bread group. Try to plan your meals so that each member of the family gets a balanced diet of these basic food groups each day. First, let's look at milk. Buy dry milk to stretch your food dollar. Dry milk gives you three quarts for the same money as one quart of homogenized milk. Dry milk saves money and is easy to prepare. Just put the proper amount of cool water into a mixing container. 
Pour the dry milk, which can be bought in either whole milk or skim milk form, and stir or shake this into your measuring cup to the proper level. And then into the container of water. You can use this right away for cooking or store it in the refrigerator for drinking or for future use. Dry milk can also be used in the preparation of breads, puddings, and creamed vegetables or meat. The directions are on the box. Additional food value, more nutritional value, can be obtained by adding dry milk to regular milk when you cook. The second food group contains most fruits and vegetables. Remember, you can save money by buying fresh fruits and vegetables in season. Canned vegetables and fruits are also good for you and are a thrifty buy when they're not being grown locally. A family garden will save you even more. Tomatoes are very good for you and can be grown on a small plot of land or even in a large bucket. Vegetables and fruits fresh from your garden taste good and you can also store them for winter use by either canning or freezing. Fruits and vegetables give you vitamins and minerals needed for growth and energy. Select those that are firm and fresh. Overripe fruits and vegetables cost less, but are not a bargain unless you plan to use them immediately. Overripe produce spoils quickly, and then your money is wasted. And don't forget, fresh fruits and vegetables should always be washed before cooking or eating them raw. When you're cooking, remember, the good taste and nutritional value of food is lost if it is cooked too long in too much water. Watch the thrifty homemaker cook vegetables. First, she rinses the pot and adds just enough water to prevent the vegetables from sticking while they cook. A small amount of pork or fat is added to the water for seasoning, together with salt, about one teaspoon per quart of water. Then she washes her vegetables, in this case cabbage, and cuts it into small pieces. When the water is just to the boiling point, she adds the cabbage and cooks it at a good simmer, not boiling, for about eight minutes or until tender. Most vegetables and fruits cook in about six to 20 minutes. Be careful not to overcook them or they will lose flavor and food value as well. The third group is meat and other high protein foods. Every person needs some meat or fish each day. You should eat lean red meat, particularly beef liver or pork liver, to build strong bodies and blood. Remember, it is the amount of lean in a piece of meat that gives you the most food value, not the price per pound or the cut. For the same money, you get three to four times the value of protein by buying hamburger rather than T-bone steaks. Consider the number of servings per pound. It will help you stretch your meat dollar. For example, neck bones may seem cheap, costing only about half as much as hamburger, but a pound of hamburger will give four servings, whereas a pound of neck bone will give only one serving of red meat. So for twice the money, you get four times the number of servings of meat. Careful preparation of meat can make even the cheapest cuts of meat taste good. Always cook your meat, roasts, chicken, and other meats at a low temperature to save the juices and flavor. Use as little water as possible when cooking meat. And keep the pot tightly covered. When you roast meat in the oven, don't overcook it. As soon as the meat is done, remove it from the oven to keep it from getting dry and hard. Other good sources of protein are nuts, peanut butter, beans, and especially soybeans. You can use soybean meal to add to your food's protein value. This meal can be mixed with regular flour or meal to make cornbread, biscuits, and other baked goods. Food made with added soybean meal tastes no different than food made with only flour or meal, but it is much richer and can be cheaper than meat for the amount of protein your body receives. 
For instance, this piece of cornbread made with two ounces of soybean meal added to the flour and cornmeal is equal in protein value to this four ounce hamburger patty. The fourth basic food group is the enriched grain products. Whenever you shop, always look for the word enriched printed on the package. This means that extra vitamins and minerals have been added to the grain, corn, rice, or wheat. Look closely at this rice. That powdery substance on the grain is very high in food value. If you wash your rice, you wash away that extra food value. So you should never wash any enriched grain product. Cook them in just enough water to be used up in cooking. If you use too much water and pour it off, you pour away those vitamins and minerals your body needs. Remember, to get a balanced diet, you should eat vegetables. First of all, leafy green and yellow vegetables, tomatoes, potatoes, and other root vegetables like carrots or beets, and fruits, especially citrus fruits, every day. For protein, eat meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and beans or peas. And remember, everyone needs some milk or milk products like cheese every day. You can complete your diet with several servings of bread, cereal, or other enriched grain products like macaroni, rice, or grits. Sweet food like desserts, candy, and sugar-sweetened drinks add to a meal's pleasure and also give you fuel to burn for energy. Everybody needs a balanced diet, but there are some cases where even eating the right food will not make you healthy. In the South, many children have intestinal parasites known as ascaris and commonly called stomach worms. They live inside the body and use up some of the food you eat. And since these worms use a part of your food for their growth, you don't get all of the value from the food which you've eaten. Getting rid of the worms will make better nutrition possible. This is simple to do. Here, at a health clinic, a nurse is giving a cherry-flavored deworming syrup to children in a community known to have worms. Each child will get just the right amount of this syrup. Now the school lunch this child eats will help him grow, not some worm living inside him. People become infested with worms by swallowing the worm eggs. When anyone puts dirty fingers, sticks, or toys into their mouths, they may be putting in worm eggs too, because these tiny eggs grow in dirt. Therefore, it is important to keep your food and the place where you eat clean. Don't take chances with your health. Cleanliness will protect your family. Always keep the place where you cook and eat in your home clean. Wash your hands and use your toilet indoors or out. Wipe up spills when they happen. Then flies and insects will not be attracted to them. Flies and insects can carry diseases and germs to any food they touch. Pets should be kept away from food storage areas as well as from cooking and eating areas. This is because pets carry dirt on their fur and some of this dirt may have worm eggs or germs of other diseases in it. Be sure that the windows and doors in your home, particularly those in your kitchen, are covered with screens to keep out flies and other insects. Look for mice and rat holes. If you find any, cover them with tin and set traps. Good nutrition comes from eating the right food, but we should also remember that good nutrition depends on each member of a family working together. The homemaker who plans, selects, and prepares the food and each person eating his share with everyone helping to keep himself and his home safe and clean. This means clean hands while cooking or eating, clean pots and pans and dishes, and a clean room in which to serve and eat fresh food, food that looks good and is good for you. Early to bed and early to rise alone cannot make you healthy and wise, but cleanliness and a nutritious diet go far, so that what you eat, you are.
Um, some people on uh, one of the comments said, this is very similar to Ro Rivas, uh, talks about worms, and um, also Who Lives With You, which is also, uh, it's the same kind of film, but it's aimed at, at older kids. Um, yes, this is all South Carolina educational television produced. Um, they basically, I think they got a grant from federal government to help address uh, kids who were malnourished and were also um, suffering from uh, intestinal parasites, the Ascaris worm. So I have uh, a couple of films from that batch. Um, there's this one, What You Eat You Are, there's Food and Drugs, there's um, Ascaris, Human Parasite, there's um, Rorivas Talks About Worms, and then there's Who Lives With You. And so they all are meant to address that, and they all kind of borrow footage heavily from each other. So you might see um, animations or uh, stock footage of kids holding their bellies uh, that are from different films. But yeah, I mean, that was 1970, and so that was a problem. Um, kids were suffering from this in, in rural areas of uh, South Carolina. And um, so, yeah, this was a way to, to kind of a, an attempt to try to get this information across. But Ro Rivas was, was, I think, the most popular, most famous, because Ro Rivas was a uh, celebrity um, on a South Carolina educational television. And so that message went far and wide and actually spawned a remake of the films, which feature a different type of Ro Rivas. It's kind of a weird thing. I don't have those films. I'm actively seeking them, but... All right, um, what time is it? Okay. Um, occasionally I, I run across films that uh, are made by religious organizations. And um, occasionally I get films that are really something. And this one is from the Church of Latter-day Saints or Brigham Young University. Um, it's made for teenagers and it is about, it's called Morality for Youth. And it is amazing. It's, it uses the analogy of a whitewater rafting trip to talk about um, the dangers that teenagers face with temptations. And I got to say that these teens that are in here are some of the most lily white, even though there's, there's a, a person of color in here, just the most guilt-ridden, bland, People, but they all have amazing skin complexions because they don't have soda. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and then the person who's talking over <coughs> the top the, is uh, was the president of the Church of Latter Day Saints at the time, a man who had lost his voice, I believe, due to cancer, but then struggled to get it back, and you know was able to talk again, but in this grouchy voice. So here it is. Morality for youth.
Well, you're getting to be a pretty good bunch of river runners. Yeah. How'd you like to do it again? You know, that river demands respect every inch of the way. I don't want to try and frighten you or seem overcautious. But I saw some things out there today that we've got to talk about. Next time, Janie, keep your shoes on. That'll protect your feet from the cold and the rocks. And life jackets must be worn at all times. No exception. A couple of you were showing off in the rapids today. We just can't have that. You know, if just one person fouls up, a whole boat can be in trouble. On the river, as in life, most people get into trouble because they either overestimate their own ability or they underestimate the forces pulling them into danger. Bishop, have you ever been in a boat that's flipped over? I have. Once when I was a young river guide, I took a group much like this one down the river. Our raft is better anyway. Okay, there's no gas. Right. Molly's gonna come with us. Yeah. All right, this is great. Let's go. Go get it. Go. Yeah. Go. Come on, you like checking. Go get it. Go. Yeah. Go. Come on. 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 Hey, you're going to need to put your life jacket on. Oh, I don't need it. There's no rapids right here. It's I'm a, a good swimmer anyway. we got to have it on. It's a forest service regulation. Okay, whatever. How's that? This is nothing. When I was here before, you should have seen it. There were so many rapids. Oh, what is this before stuff? And there was, there was a bunch of deer up there, and it was, it was really pretty. Steve, has anybody drowned or got killed on this river? Yeah, once in a while, things like that can happen. Hey, Steve, let's take those rapids over there. They're a lot better. No way, we'll never make it that way. You're just too chicken. Here, let me do it. All right, let's go. I know what I'm doing. Oh, no, Don't worry.
we almost lost Molly. That day I realized there are things we do we can't undo. People can drown. You know, as a bishop, I, I often think of the river and the lessons it teaches us. A run down the river is a lot like staying morally clean. You have to obey the rules and follow good counsel to get through safely. I know that some of you are in the rapids now. I just hope you're pointed in the right direction when you hit the big waves. Or you could capsize your lives. I like you guys. I don't want to lose any of you. Let's talk about sexual morality in the river. President Kimball has had a great deal to say about morality. I've heard him say that you young people are wholesome and basically good and sound. I believe that our young people are wholesome and basically good and sound. But they too are traveling where great disasters can come unless warnings are heeded. Concerning sexual purity, President Kimball has warned us that Satan will use his logic to confuse us and everything in his power to destroy us. He'll shade meanings, open doors an inch at a time, to lead us from the purest white through all the shades of gray to darkest black. That the church's stand on morality may be understood, we declare firmly and unalterably. It is not an outworn garment, faded, old-fashioned, and threadbare. The law of chastity will always be basic in God's world and in the Lord's church. The sexual drives which bind men and women together as one are good and necessary. But here, more than almost any other place, we must exercise self-control. These drives, which are the fountain head of human life, are to be allowed expressing only in the sanctity of the marriage. During my years on the river, and as a bishop, a lot of young people like yourselves have shared their thoughts about morality with me. Sex is sacred. It's a gift, and it's one of the most um, sacred powers. It's such a special thing and that you grow maybe closer to each other, you and your partner, and closer to our Heavenly Father in doing this, but it should be when you're married. And something that I think our Heavenly Father has given us to bring a man and a wife closer together and to make a oneness that needs to be there and a partnership, a partnership that um, you use with your Heavenly Father to bring spirits down in the, to earth. Immorality does not begin in adultery or perversion. It begins with little indiscretions, thoughts about sex, talking about sex, and even a kiss or two could lead you into trouble. And so once you've held the boy's hands, it's hard to not hold his hand. And once you've kissed him, it's hard to stop kissing and go back to holding hands. And once you've kissed a lot, it's hard to just say, kiss with one good night kiss. When we talk of sex, our first thought is adultery and fornication. But our second one, and close on its heels, is the sex stimulation to self and others, sometimes called petting. It's a damning and a damnable transgression. And then, of course, it is also the gateway to the final acts of fornication and adultery. The young man is untrue to his manhood, who promises popularity, good times, security, fun, and even love, when all he can give is passion and its diabolical fruits, guilt complexes, disgust, hatred, abhorrence, eventual loathing, and possible pregnancy without legitimacy and honor. And you girls are untrue to yourselves if you encourage or allow this to happen. You know, sometimes the way you dress or the way you act makes these guys think that you're interested in something different than you really are. That's like playing in the rapids. When you're in the whitewater, things can happen fast. Masturbation, or rather common indiscretion, is not approved of the Lord, nor of His church. Anyone burdened by this weakness should certainly abandon the habit. Sometimes masturbation is the introduction to the more serious sins of exhibitionism and the gross sin of homosexuality. I hope fervently that I am making clear the position of the Lord and His Church on these unmentionable practices. Also, President Kimball has warned us over and over again 
to leave pornography alone? Well, I know I had a bit of a problem with pornography. I felt like I had to see more and more. It was almost like I was addicted to it. And then this one day, somebody came in with a new magazine or something, and everybody walked over to see them. And uh, I got up, and at that same moment, a TV commercial came on, and this guy just said that some laundry detergent was stronger than dirt. And that just hit me with such a force. It was as if the Lord had spoken to me, that something was stronger than dirt, and I felt I have got to be stronger than dirt. And that was a turning point for me. Sex is sacred and should not be misused. The experience that may bring the greatest joy and fulfillment in life can also bring the greatest sorrow and remorse if wrongly used. We may do as we please, but we can't avoid responsibility. We may break the laws, but we can't avoid the penalties. You don't get away with anything. God is just. Things that I did, I didn't forgive myself very easy from. And a lot of times I thought to myself, no, Heavenly Father doesn't forgive me. I'm not good enough to go to the temple. I'm not good enough to have a good, clean life, a good, clean family. And I projected it to be that this was the way Heavenly Father felt about me. You need to know that you're loved. But if you have gone wrong, the Lord and the church can forgive. The way of the transgressor is hard and tough and long and thorny. But the Lord has promised that for all those sins and errors outside of the named unpardonable sins, there is forgiveness. But many people misunderstand the principle of repentance and have the misconception that a few prayers can bounce them back in moments or hours the long distance that they skidded over months and possibly years. A lot of people try and do it and don't succeed because others won't let them. They don't want their friends to succeed if they can't. They say, well, I can't be good, so why should she? And I'm going to make sure she's not. I felt just totally helpless until I went and talked to my bishop. And then he made me realize that it wasn't a helpless case. You can do things about it. You can get your self-confidence back and your self-respect. It's your responsibility to navigate your own lives. Let's talk about specifics. What can you do to stay morally clean? I always make my decisions before, so like if anybody ever asked me to go on a date or something before I'm 16, then I've already made that decision that I'm not going to, so it won't be hard for me to say no. The Lord has set these standards, and I as a priesthood bearer have the responsibility to, to keep myself morally clean and to help my friends keep the same standards. My dad, when I turned 16, he sat me down and he said, okay, what are your goals? And I said, oh, huh? <laughs> I already made some up. And he said, that's not good enough. And so we sat and we talked about it. And I decided that I, would, I wouldn't single date for at least a year. And I didn't. And we have long interviews, you know. Usually they're like 15 minutes. And he goes deeper into his interviews, especially with me, because I'm his son, you know, I guess. And, you know, by the types of things he says, I can tell that he cares. Okay, well, to start out my date, before the guy even comes and picks me up, I always have a prayer. Just, just so that I'll be on my toes, you know, that I'll have a good evening, I'll have fun, so that I, I'll be more comfortable if I know that Heavenly Father's on my side and he's watching me. President Kimball says that dating, especially steady dating in your early teens, can be very hazardous. It distorts your whole picture of life. It deprives you of many worthwhile and rich experiences. That's something to think about. You all have, or someday will have, deep feelings and strong sexual drives. The Lord intends it that way. But these feelings are difficult to control, and we must be sure they are not misused. These feelings, the friends you have and the places you go together, make all the difference. They influence what you think and what you do. You have to decide how far you're going to let it go. Um, are you going to let him put his arm around you? Are you going to let him kiss you? What are you going to do? And you have to decide before you ever go with him. Because when you're there, it's too late. 
they make you feel like, well, to strengthen our relationship, we need this and this. And, you know, when you're dating non-members or whatever, and even a lot of the members of the church are like this, they, they feel like they want to they make the relationship grow and be more more close and you can't you have to in my mind you have to wait till you're married to have a strong bond like that like in high school you don't need that you sh really what you need is a friend so as long as i'm clean i will be able to face my heavenly father with no regrets and another thing is the self-pride in knowing hey i can do it can you control those feelings if you go to the wrong kind of movies it's impossible and what about pornography now, i've come to realize that pornography can be worse than alcohol. Alcohol leaves our system eventually, but the images of pornography can stay in our minds indefinitely. And I guess the smart ones are the ones that never take that first look. As a river guide, I'd suggest that you steer away from situations or places that can cause trouble. But if that's impossible, and you find your feelings getting out of control, then get out of there, fast, and take your friends with you. I guess it's up to me the person I want to be. I, I have to decide. I have to be responsible for my own actions, no matter who I'm with or where I am. It's really up to me. Let's consider your choice of friends. That can make a big difference. The people who you think are your best, best friends can be your worst enemies because they want you to be just like them. If they're not good for you, you can't be with them because they're going to hurt you. We talk a lot about the negative peer pressure and, and, you know, that can be remedied a little bit by going with the right kind of friends and stuff, but positive peer pressure is really important. And it can work not just so much to keep you out of trouble, but to make you a better person. After my parents have spent so much time in raising me and then, you know, if I go turn 15 and I'm into sex already, then everything that they've looked forward to and all the hard teaching that they've worked on is down the tube. Surround yourself with friends who share the same standards and ideals. Grow strong. Stand strong together. Help each other keep these feelings under control. Stay away from those danger spots on the river. One more thought, perhaps the most important of all. Remember, the guide who knows you best is your Father in Heaven. He has set the standards. Stay close to Him through prayer. I think, um... I gained a close relationship with my Heavenly Father. And How were you able to accomplish that? Through prayer. Um, <laughs> he's really <laughs> my best friend. Mm, I think he trusts us a lot and sometimes we let him down. And I don't think it's very fair to him. And I know he loves me. And I don't want to hurt him. Brothers and sisters, we love you. We're proud of you. Most of you have lived beyond reproach. We're grateful for that. There are any who have had problems. They are solvable. We ask the Lord's blessings upon you all the days of your life. So he set me on my journey down the river. And he said he would always find me. He taught me the joy
what an amazing film. Those kids are so filled with guilt. It's, uh, it's amazing. Um, you know, speaking about these heady ideas of morality, um, and they're just little teenagers. Um, really. And then the, the river rafting analog, you know, parallel to having sex. <laughs> it's just, that girl almost died because you wanted something exciting. Um, wow. All right, one last film. And uh, I know so many of you have been asking for this and, and really have a lot of questions about this. And this is for young people as well. And maybe for adults, this is good advice. But uh, this is how to use a pocket calculator. Millions of people use pocket calculators every day. They may be used in drafting or by salespeople in showrooms. There are hundreds of different uses for calculators and a surprising variety of specially designed calculators to do certain jobs. There are calculators that are programmable, just like a computer. Others are designed to handle scientific work accounting, or banking. You can even find calculators that fit your wallet or that have clocks. And would you believe that there are even calculators that can talk? Four, nine, six, four. They're built specifically for blind people. Except for talking, they work the same way as other calculators. But with all the different styles and features available, how can you pick out the right personal calculator for yourself? First, you should have some idea of what you wanted to do and how much you can afford to spend. You'll probably want one that can at least add, subtract, multiply, and divide. There are other things to consider in choosing a calculator for yourself. For instance, it's nice to have keys that click so that when you push a key, you know that you've entered the number. You'll probably want it to be strong, so that if you accidentally drop it, it won't break. You may want it to be an algebraic calculator, so you can enter the problem in the same way that you would work it on paper. There are other kinds. If you should choose a different type of calculator, You'll need to learn how to operate it from the store clerk where you bought it, or from your teacher. No doubt you'll want a good warranty so that if your calculator goes bad, you can send it back and get it repaired rapidly and economically. Make sure that the display is easy to read. Some calculator displays are harder to read than others. And make sure that the calculator's keys fit your fingers easily. No particular kind is better than another. It's up to you and what you're looking for in a calculator. When you get a new calculator, you'll want to see how it works. You can start with a simple addition problem, 26 plus 49. Before you start any computations, always press the clear key. To add these two numbers, you first enter the number 26 in your calculator. To do this, Press the key labeled 2, and then press the key labeled 6. Now the number 26 is shown in the display. Next, press the plus sign. Now you enter the other number, 49, by pressing the 4 key and the 9 key in that order. Notice that the number in the display is now 49. Now that you've entered both numbers, you just push the equal key and the answer to the problem, 75, appears in the display. Now suppose that you have three or more numbers to add. The problem, 
is 43 plus 37 plus 22. To work this one, you go about it the same way. You enter the first number, 43, by pushing the 4 key and the 3 key. Then press the plus key. The next number to be added is 37. So you enter it by pressing the 3 key and the 7 key. Then push the plus key. The last number to be added is 22. Enter it by pressing the 2 key twice. Now that all the information has been fed into the calculator, the final step is to push the equal key. And the correct answer appears as 102. Now that you've mastered adding with the pocket calculator, we can move on to the next function, subtraction. But remember, before starting a new problem, always press the clear key to get rid of any numbers that may be stored in your calculator. Subtraction is done the same way as addition, but using the minus key instead of the plus. To work this problem, we enter the first number, 297. To do this, you press the 2 key, 9, and the 7. The number you've entered, 297, now appears in the digital display. Since this is a subtraction problem, you press the minus key. Next, enter the remaining number, 137, by pressing the 1, 3, and 7 keys in that sequence. The number 137 should appear in the display. Now all you need to do is press the equal key and the answer appears in the display as 160. Here's a real life subtraction problem. Suppose you have 297 football trading cards and give away 76 of them. The problem would be 297 minus 76 equal. Press the keys in the correct order, and you've got the answer, 221. You'd have 221 football cards left. But be careful. Sometimes subtraction problems come out with negative numbers. If you know that there are 72 packs of pop and six cans to a pack, how many are there altogether? By multiplying 72 times 6 on the calculator, the answer is there are 432 cans of pop. But be careful. You may multiply numbers that give an answer larger than your calculator will display. If the number is too large, the calculator's display will either flash the numbers on and off or flash a line of ease. If the number is too large, you'll have to find another way to work the problem. Another function that the calculator performs is division using the divide key. Division problems are solved in a similar manner to addition, subtraction, and multiplication problems. Suppose you want to divide 923 by 46. You enter the numbers in the same way you have with the other functions, 9, 2, 3, divide, 4, 6, equal. If you have an eight-digit calculator, the answer shows up as 20.2. 065217. Let's try another division problem. Suppose you have 438 trading cards that you want to divide equally among six friends. The problem is stated 438 divided by 6 equal. So, using the calculator, you enter 4, 3, 8, Push the divide key, enter 6, and push the equal key. The answer is 73. So 73 cards would go to each of your friends. Now that you know how to perform the four basic functions with your calculator, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, let's try something a bit more complicated. Here's the problem. 36 minus 21 times 43 plus 62 divided by 3. If you work this problem across from left to right on the simplest calculators as you've done in the previous problems, you'll get the wrong answer. Let's try it that way. 
she enters three, six, minus, two, one, times, four, three, plus, six, two, divide, three, equal. The calculator displays 235.66666. That's not correct. Can you guess why the answer is wrong? She ignored the parentheses. In solving this kind of problem, you have to work the parts in the parentheses first. You do the problem in several steps, starting from the left. First, enter 36, subtract 21 on the calculator. The answer is 15. Record the 15 on a worksheet. Then clear the calculator and add 43 plus 62. The answer is 105. Write down 105 on the worksheet and clear the calculator. Now, using the calculator, you multiply 15 times 105 for 1575. You write down 1575 on the worksheet. Then divide the 1575 by 3, and the correct answer is 525. If you are using a more complex calculator that's equipped with parenthesis keys, you can work this problem in just one step if you make certain to use the parentheses when entering the problem in your calculator. Many calculators are equipped with a percent key. Calculating percentages can be a very useful function. For example, suppose you saw a new racing bike that cost $175. It's advertised at 15% off plus 5% tax. How much would it cost? Here's the way the problem would be stated. But in order for your calculator to handle the problem correctly, it will need to be treated like this. Notice that the 175 minus 15% is placed within parentheses to be worked separately. You would enter one seven, five, minus, one, five, and press the percent key. At this point, push the equal key. The answer appears as 148.75. This means that at 15% off the retail price of $175, the bicycle would cost 148.75. But now you have to add the 5% tax. The 148.75 is already in the calculator, so you just press the plus key, then 5, then the percent key, and finally the equal key. The answer is 156.1875, or $156.19 is the total price of the bicycle. Other function keys are the square root and square of a number keys. If you wish to find the square root of a number, such as 64, enter 64, push the square root key, and the answer is 8. Or if you wanted to square a number, you use the x squared key. Let's enter 8 and square it. The answer is 64. So you can see that the square root key and the square key, in a sense, cancel each other. To see this, let's try 5 squared is 25. The square root of 25 is 5. Many calculators also have memory keys. If you have this type, find out how your particular model works. But in the meantime, you can use the basic functions you've already learned to do many things. For example, suppose you wanted to quickly find out how many minutes there are in a year. That's a big number. 
There are 365 days in a year, times 24 hours in a day, times 60 minutes in an hour, equals 525,600 minutes in a year. So hard or long computational problems are made simple. When your parents go shopping, you could go along and calculate the best buys in the grocery store. For example, the best unit prices on different sizes of detergent. Or you might add up the grocery bill as you go. You could also use the calculator to check your math homework. But be sure to get permission from your teacher before using your calculator to work school math assignments. Remember, no matter what kind of calculator you use, you still need to know how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide because you must know how to set up the problems. So don't become too dependent on your calculator. A calculator is fast, accurate, can handle large numbers, it is fun to operate. But it takes a trained person to make it perform properly. You. So it looks like we had a little internet blip. Um, it couldn't take all the technology that I was shoving down its throat. Um, that film's kind of awesome. It's definitely a niche film. And uh, embarrassingly, I probably told this story before, but I was doing a screening in San Francisco at Other Cinema with Craig Baldwin. And I had pulled a film called uh, The Haunted. Uh, it was called... Uh, shoot taking care of your school. And um, the premise of that, it's a Centron film. And so all the Centron films from the time period all come in these orange cans. Uh, and so I pulled the film and I put it, and I didn't watch it. I was just like, oh, here it is. Boop, boop, boop. I spliced it in. And then I was showing it in San Francisco and I showed using a pocket calculator instead. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed because it's a very different vibe and it's a different group, but people really dug it. I mean, for the reasons that you guys dug it. So um, I felt like I had to show it. It's it's really quite wonderful. And it's of a time, man. You know, calculators. Um, hold on to them so they don't drop. Um, thanks, guys, for tuning in today. And thanks so much for uh, giving me your eyeballs to play with for a little while. Um, coffee. You can buy us coffee here. Uh, that money is going to go pay for the pallet jack that I just bought yesterday. Um, also, people who have uh, donated in the past, uh, I'm sending out t-shirts. I'm sending out probably a dozen at a time so I don't overwhelm the post office and the mail people. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, so tomorrow, 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to be schlepping myself and my assistant. And my wife is going to be there for moral support. We're going to be schlepping 13 pallets of films, um, you know, knock on wood, uh, into a new storage unit. So that's roughly between 88 and 9,500 new films from Coronet. Um, so I hope to be here at 1 o'clock tomorrow. Um, if something happens, like, uh, you know, I'm not wearing safety shoes or something, um, then I don't know. We'll just, we'll just play it by ear. It should be fine. We should be okay. Um, and I'll have, hopefully, some stuff to show you. Uh, maybe pictures or, at the very least, a box of films that we can look at and watch together for the first time. But um, thanks for uh, being along on the journey. Uh, it's exciting. This is the biggest collection I've gotten at one time. Normally, I get around... The most I've gotten, I think, in one thing was like 3,500 films. And this is novel because the films are coming to me versus me driving a giant truck to go pick them up. Um, so, awesome. But uh, thanks again so much, and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. That's my, my feeling, is we'll see you again tomorrow. Um, yes. Take care. Bye.